Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's great, always great to see a full audience. Um, well, we've got a really great panel here. Just um, saying it now, if there are other things that people would like to ask the speakers, then please, please do go to the Meet Speakers session after this, where you can get one-on-one -on -one time, which is always great. Um, so what we would really like to do um, today is to make sure that everyone in the audience will go away with some kind of ideas and plans that you can take back to your companies. Um, also knowing full well as well what the limitations and challenges you may face when you put those proposals to your bosses or roll it out across a unit. So with that in mind, um, because we have a diverse panel here, it would be great to start off with what has made an impact AI-wise on the indus um, insurance industry right now? What has already made an impact and has the potential to be rolled out further across the different uh, units and areas that you work on? So Richard, would you like to go first? I'll kick off. Uh, so, so, so I draw a focus on, on commercial insurance. Um, I think one of the principal areas of, of, of impact that, that we see and our customers are experiencing is um, improved risk selection, um, pricing and automation of SME commercial insurance, um, making it more, um, more frictionless for customers to buy insurance, easier for brokers to place insurance, and helping commercial insurers differentiate the risk in a more granular way to ultimately um, improve their profitability. So that's kind of very intrinsic to our experience. I think it is, it's probably the number one area of impact. Okay, well, I think, um, I think AI has the possibility to disrupt insurance to the point where the industry might die, but that might be the topic for a whole other panel. But if you can predict the risk of an individual down to 100%, you're gonna get ill or not, um, then that industry might, might be in, in danger of, um, of being extinct. Uh, more short term, more long, more really down to earth. The sort of projects that we work with in Pivigo together with insurance businesses have actually been quite a lot around the sales and customer understanding side. So understanding how to segment your customers, understanding who you should be talking to, how, how you should price things correctly. And that's bringing bottom line benefits straight away to these businesses. Uh, from my perspective, so Excel Catlin is a specialty in complex risk insurer in the commercial space. We, uh, we are trying to understand un managing uncertainty in better ways. And while it's complex risk is hard to understand inherently, um, we're seeing that the growing sources of data and the ability to analyze and generate insights is really having a great impact in our ability to, again, do risk selection, segmentation, uh, and identify new markets and opportunities. So that's a great space. I mean, in addition to um, the, the topics that the panel said, there, there is a new angle as well that is becoming quite um, important in insurance, which is around, like if you think about the traditional insurance value chain, it's getting to know the customer, underwriting the risk, paying for the claim or dealing with the claim, and then having some form of enterprise level risk management and including some sort of investments and so on. So these are more like a traditional components of any sort of insurance value chain. But the thing that is happening more and more recently is um, the use of various new technologies, including sensors, including, uh, including machine learning and so on, um, to, to understand a, a more dynamic aspect of the risk and trying to prevent it. Like for example, in cyber, which is something that we do at AIG, um, we, we are using, for example, machine learning in order to monitor the traffic of a network and try to give our customers some sort of a heads up around um, certain behaviors in the network of certain devices activity and so on being uh, risky and, and maybe indicative of a cyber attack and so on. So, so in a sense, that there are a lot of these sort of um, additional servicing that is uh, further and further becoming AI driven. Okay, when it comes to um, rolling these out, do you think there's been more um, of a maybe misfocus more on the automation side rather than using machine learning in key areas that would have a wider, I suppose, dispersive success in terms of efficiency or in terms of risk management? Probably on that point, I think just to build on Reza's point, um, one, of the, one of the maybe exceptional aspects of the insurance industry is it's so um, complicated in the value chain. It's maybe kind of eight parties you have person seeking insurance, you have the retrocession capital, the reinsurer at the other end, and in between there's like six or seven parties. That introduces a huge amount of coordination cost 
and, and innovating when there's maybe eight different parties that all have their own vested interests and, and innovating on how to change and reduce transaction costs across the entire industry is extremely hard. Um, and it's also true maybe for every pound in premium, um, kind of 40% or 40 pence of that is pure cost to the entire industry. Um, which, when, when you compare that to other industries, it's extremely high. So the cost of insurance, of writing insurance, is extremely high relative to other industries. But that means I think more fundamental innovations have, have been harder in insurance versus something like search, where, where it's, got, it's kind of more of a, an end-to-end -end barrel, um, like one company can produce the entire experience. And innovating on search is easier because you know it's going kind to of Google versus Yahoo. Insurance, the industry is, is so elongated and it's so parcelized, it's very, very hard to do that. So I think that's the kind of wider point, which is maybe why, why it's harder to do. And, and I would ask a, a question to my fellow panelists on the right who are in, in big organizations around the culture shift that is needed to do these kind of machine learning projects within an organization that has been used to working with data for hundreds of years and who use very sophisticated methods, but maybe not the latest and, and, and trendiest machine learning tools. How difficult that is to, to get in, involved in with traditional talent, because that is, in my feeling, one of the challenges that the industry faces. So, to, to tackle the, the journey of learning, yeah. essentially, what we form as a program is a program of experimentation. So you kind of don't know all the answers, but you need to start somewhere. And working with the business to try and articulate and frame a, a challenge, an opportunity, and then try and understand how do you tackle this, something rel relatively tangible, and take that to delivery. And I think bringing together the business on that learning where you say, well, you know, we have multiple stakeholders in the play, and we partner with external companies um, to try and understand how does a new technology or an emerging technology potentially have an impact in driving uh, business benefits. And through that learning, you get people inside more excited about informed change rather than change which they don't really understand. Um, and that, once delivered, becomes kind of a showcase or a case study that you could socialize. And I think the more you show and tell, the potential for benefit and understanding and learning is, is greater. Reza. I think the, one of the biggest challenges um, in the industry is that, uh, and it's not just insurance, a lot of other industries are experiencing the same thing, is this whole concept of ecosystems and how it's really hard right now to, to, to kind of um, to kind of think about insurance as insurance and, and the competition to be among insurance companies. Every uh, industry is being heavily software-driven, AI-driven. So as a result, anybody who's got a lot of expertise in, in the deep tech space, particularly around software and AI, could end up aiming for broadening their um, kind of sector a little bit. So for example, you see Google originally had a mission of indexing the information in the world and now Autonomous vehicles is part of the agenda, healthcare is part of the agenda, and the list goes on. Same happens to Amazon, same happens to Apple, same happens to a lot of other companies. And I think what kind of magnified this issue is the fact that everything is becoming software and machine learning. So, so with that in mind, um, I think insurers um, are, are going to have a much bigger challenge in terms of are we better than yesterday? I think most insurers have got a way of um, making the answer to that yes. Because they're bringing a lot of new talent, they're doing a lot of new things. But I think what, what makes the speed of this change extremely critical is the fact that competition is not with, um, of insurers with each other anymore. The competition is, uh, for example, in car manufacturing. Are you competing with Tesla or are you competing with another insurer? In other words, Tesla is selling uh, 100,000 unit cars, um, $100,000 per unit cars with 25,000 margin. So offering a 1,000 insurance on top of it doesn't seem to be that difficult compared to, uh, and the fact that they have extremely great relationship with their customers puts them in a very unique place to just go in and say, you know what, we don't need that whole six, seven part insurance value chain. We just need a balance sheet to come to terms with us on this grand agreement. Um, so I think, I think there is a lot of these sort of stuff happening that um, I, think, I think insurers need to wake up to a new reality of, um, a, a, a within a, a multi-sector kind of competition, and I think, and that's new for everyone. Insurers are not alone, but I think it's going to be uh, quite a challenging uh, landscape to 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 kind of navigate. But, 
I think that's a really great point um, in terms of the, the speed of change or the speed of being able to offer insurance. Because maybe you know, 10 years ago, insurers say, okay, we're going we're gonna to write a certain product or policy for 10 years and then we'll have enough claims data to be like, you know, one of the market leaders here. But then today, if someone like Amazon or, or Tesla can say, well, we own the asset here, so we, we own the data. And actually then building insurance on top of that is not, it, it's not like, it's so much a solvable problem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, like, for example, um, a lot of these companies, like, for example, imagine a company that might not seem that relevant. Let's say Uber. Uber right now is in the business of delivering your food mm -hmm. and also is in the business of seeing you in the morning and the evening where you might be happy or unhappy or angry based on the rating your driver gives you. They have a view of how your mental health might be and then they know what you eat. And then a little bit later, uh, they might end up having a, a, like if they pair up their data with some of the, like for example, if they see how often do you go to a hospital or your GP based on address, they might end up knowing a lot about your health, a company that you never associate with health. So, and then they could end up saying, you know what, we go to Swissery and, and, and convince them to uh, put part of their balance sheet behind this new insurance offering that if you order food with Uber, get your drivers with Uber, we get you to doctors for free, we schedule your appointments, and we give you healthy food, et cetera, et cetera. And if anything happens, you need a medical claim, we'll, we'll, we'll intermediate uh, the claim being paid at, at, based on these parameters and so on. I, I, I literally just made that up right now. So it's not very difficult to sit back and think and see how tens of these giant tech companies that end up having a lot of information about um, individuals and on top of that have got a very great meaningful positive relationship with them in a way that the relationship is loved by the customers could end up entering the insurance landscape and, and, and disrupting it. So well, and, and just sorry but uh, you may not have read the news today but apparently Uber has today announced that actually they want to start predicting if you're drunk or not based on your behavior. So they might be going down Predicting? If you're drunk or not. Oh, okay. There like you go. how often you're drunk. They've had a yeah. few issues. <laughs> They're also thinking as well of uh, trying to do the whole city map of thing as well, of all the different transport links, knowing what your most likely route is and things like that, and broadening it out that way, I think whether it, you can do, go on bikes. So I mean, that's huge, feasible. I think a huge component of these sort of stuff becoming possible is the fact that everything is becoming software, and in the software world, everything is becoming machine learning driven. Uh, 10 years ago, it would have been difficult to imagine a transportation company wanting to do a healthcare play or food play. It's a different gig. But now it's software, it's AI. If you have a great expertise there, why not experimenting in this direction? Uh, kind of, I think the wider point around AI is um, the cost of prediction is, is coming down drastically. Similar to maybe 20 years ago, the cost of communication came down. People had mobile phones. Now we communicate a lot more with more people. And that's why social net networking took off. But the cost, I mean, insurance is intrinsically a prediction problem. You're predicting what would happen in the future, you don't know what that is. And you're specifically predicting a, a loss event um, or, or, or a claim. So if you think about what AI is, it's basically producing predictions. If you think about what insurance needs, it's making predictions. Um, there's very close alignment between those things, but it makes it, any, it kind of relatively easy for anyone investing fundamentally in AI to provide something in insurance that works. Um, so yeah, I think there is an exogenous threat to the industry, sure. So what are the practical steps that the insurance industry can take right now in order to divide and conquer? Do that show and tell when you have all the multi-sector, all these headwinds coming from all these different areas that are kind of pinching on it. Where, how can, as a traditional insurer, let's say, be able to show and tell new kind of technology in certain areas? Because the, the supply chain is so complex. Where would you start? Or where would you say are kind of areas that you can really own and then be able to show um, the boss, show how that structure is working in order to get that funding, to get those costs put against it, to get the staff in order to be able to implement it. I think um, there, there is a professor at Harvard Business School that studies a lot of these sort of situations because I think what's happening right now is that a lot of the new problems we work on is not what we could call standard. A lot of them are new and they need a different setting and, and like an insurance company might partner with a startup, with a legal firm, as well as uh, a government organization. So a lot of these things end up becoming what they call teaming, teamwork on the fly. Um, and I think the interesting thing there is that the, the result of uh, that's their studies is suggesting that the, 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 the teams and groups that are successful in these sort of situations are the ones that have situational humility and, and show curiosity and, and, and are willing to take risk. So, um, and I think, I think it's, they're, they're very important. Like if, if insurers enter this story by saying, 
we know insurance because it's our business, not reflecting on the fact that there is a big change happening, I think that that situational humility will disappear and that will make it very difficult uh, for, for, for the success to, uh, to result. Um, and on top of that, curiosity is important. Like we, we, we must open our eyes to, to the reality of the world around us. A lot has changed since 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 10 years ago, even three years ago. Uh, so, uh, so as a result, that curiosity is, is going to be one of the key drivers. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, is our ability to take risks. I mean, as a business, uh, insurers have been taking risk, and it's time for that to uh, kind of expand a little bit, to be taking risk in our thinking, taking risk in our uh, initiatives and so on. I mean, like at AIG, for example, in my team, um, in order for us to kind of reflect on a lot of these things, we've got a very good diverse uh, kind of types of talent in the team. Like, we've got designers, we've got engineers, we've got product owners and product thinkers, and of course, we've got machine learning scientists. And, and, and the interaction of all of them together uh, under some projects at the beginning might look a little bit risky, but eventually uh, we see our mission to be to de-risk the AI initiatives for the company. We, we take the risky bit, make it, uh, in a, make it to, take it to the stage that when the rest of the business sees it, they can see, okay, that, that seems to be doable now. We don't see huge risk in it, and then expanding it from there. So, so I think I, I, I think there are some mindset changes that is needed, and some insurers have been very good at it, but again, I think it's a matter of speed. We need to be much, much faster, I guess. So, talk, talking about talking a little bit about mindset change, I think one of the things that um, we're seeing more and more of is whilst we are doing experimenting and seeing things you know, through experiments being noticeably improving or having benefits, but the business's lens is more on, well, then how do we put this back into the traditional sausage machine to go back into delivery? And that is fundamentally wrong. We're trying to rethink and reimagine ins imagine insurance in the new world. We cannot take something that's innovative and put that solution same back into the, the delivery machine. Therefore, the thinking in the business needs to change. Therefore, you know, for some of the people working in the business, and making this happen uh, need to be mindful of what this means for them and how are they going to uh, look at that change um, touching the customer at the end, laid out. The way I see it, um, and it's come out here already, is the two challenges we have is access to data. So you were talking about the Uber collecting data and, and all the big tech giants collecting data. And it's, it's skills and culture change. And the, there's an opportunity there as well because, the, first of all, the insurance businesses have an incredible amount of data already that really needs to be tapped into properly. And maybe the next option is, as you say, not to look at insurance as, as one isolated industry, but try to create partnerships with other organizations that may have data. Don't try to partner with Uber because they won't do it. But there are a lot of other traditional businesses that would love to share data and that would love to see the, the joint benefit that can come out of that. Um, so that's something I would explore. Um, and then the other one is that culture shift and making sure that you can embed and can, can embed this new way of thinking into the organization and can get that commitment from really from the top of the organization to making sure and understanding that, yes, it is a revolution. You need to stay on, on top of things or you will be left behind and, and, and possibly be unfortunately extinct. Mm. Uh, I, I definitely agree. Um, from the point of view of, I think partnerships are, are, are vital. I think I definitely believe in, in the kind of two pizza rule, um, two pizza kind of rule which came out of Amazon, which is you just need a small group of people partnering on big ambitious problems that can be deployed end to end. So I agree with your point of kind of end to end delivery. It's very hard to kind of make something innovative and then apply it into a legacy environment. So kind of starting from the idea all the way through to implementation and focusing on, on full stack products where they have the data all the way to the underwriting, all the way to the customer decision, really, really important. Um, I also think it's important on, on the point of, 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 of combining skills. We're, we're partners with Excel Kaplan, and we combine a lot of their skills and, and their internal data with our technology skills and external data. And, 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 and the, the value of that is, is, is more than the sum of the parts. We get much more value from that, and we've had a lot of success combining deep industry knowledge with, with artificial intelligence expertise to de deliver outcomes. I think that's the model going forward. We were talking earlier, it's really, really hard to attract talent to this industry. Um, insurance is not seen as a, a glamorous 
area to work in. It's very hard to take a top uh, scientist from a world-leading university and, and really sell them on insurance. It's probably harder to do that if you already work for a big insurance company than it is for a, a startup. Because a startup, you can be more mission-focused. You can talk about how you're changing the world. And, and um, the great thing about startups is that everyone believes that and they feel ownership of that. If you work for a large insurance company, often the goals that the CEO of that company sets will be kind of short term. Um, and, and so it's going to hard motivation to do that. So I think that's why partnership is important. And, it, and if not partnership, then separating clearly between the business today and, and then these like big goals that, that can transform from within. Yeah, I think the, the talent point, I think, is maybe the most important point of this whole thing. Uh, like we talk about culture change, we talk about uh, the nature of innovation and all those things. The reality is that if you have the right talent in the company, they will start to make noises and make things happen. And, um, and I think, um, as Richard was saying, it's, it's very difficult in terms of, um, I think particularly London right now, w what is happening is that there's a lot of changes happening in the AI space in London that is, is, is a fast-paced uh, kind of changing environment. Like, up until a year ago, London had a salary range for a good scientist, let's say fresh out of university, and New York had a different one, and maybe Silicon Valley had a different one. They were like, London was roughly around X, maybe New York was a little bit close to a 2X, maybe. Reality is the same employers are hiring in the two places, and, and London is catching up. Then there is another trend. Uh, so in other words, if you're an insurer that just convince the HR department that this is the right salary to pay for a, a, a kind of like a fresh graduate. And now you need to upgrade that number again because what's happening is that AI as, as, as an industry is upgrading the salary numbers because until a year ago, autonomous vehicle maybe was not that big of a deal. Now every car company is hiring scientists. Every marketing department is hiring scientists. Every, the list goes on. So, so as a result, it's, it's a very challenging environment right when you think you figured it out you immediately need to go back and change it because the market is fast. And I think in, in a lot of big companies, these sort of dialogues of uh, let's respond to that change, let's respond to this change and so on, could take a little bit long. And I think, again, it comes back to the speed of, of reacting to the realities of the world and, and also uh, always emphasizing the importance of talents. While as a giant company, there's a lot of good talent in-house, but the, the need for an additional talent not in the form of consulting or partnership, even in the form of like actual um, employees is, is quite critical because at the end of the day, um, employees are, are, are the necessity that we, we have as, a, as any company to, to, to succeed. So while partnerships are good, while uh, a lot of other forms of engagements with, with, with external entities are good, but ultimately what makes a brand succeed is, is, is hugely talent driven. So HR departments, I think, probably are gonna have the hardest time in the next few years to, to, uh, to upgrade the talent strategies um, very quickly and also with the right bullet points, uh, I think. There's definitely also, I think, a paradox um, that exists because insurance is intrinsically very, very interesting and it's a fascinating problem. Uh, pricing risk is generally, is a kind of cognitively, it's one of the hardest things to do for humans to like take decisions in uncertainty. And when you look at hedge funds, they're intensely glamorous places to work for. If you look at Citadel, they'll say, you know, we price risk. Everyone wants to go and work there. It's a really interesting intellectual problem. The insurance industry is doing the same thing, but its value proposition doesn't resonate with people. So I think a lot of big insurers, that they could probably think about, like, how do they reposition themselves to this new type of talent? Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think, Kim, Yes, you, uh, so, so I was also going to make a point around actuaries. <laughs> And, and, and that there's this very um, mixed opinion about, well, not mixed opinion, but um, there's mixed value in actuaries. And, and I'm, I'm trying to be careful in what I say here, but some actuaries will be hard to retrain into machine learning people who understand the idea of, of data science and AI. However, there's also a pool of actuaries who'd love to jump on that but who struggle. So I've met people who are actuaries in insurance who say, I would love to become a data scientist, but I'm kind of pigeonholed into, into my actuarial role and I can't make that transition. And actually, an interesting project that um, not we did, but, but a, a good friend of mine did in another insurance business was that they did an internal HR project where they had HR go through all the CVs, all the individuals within the organization to try to pinpoint those that had, might have an aptitude towards analytics, might have an interest towards it, and then try to find them wherever they were, because obviously they have a very deep understanding around your business, which is fantastic, 
and then try to upskill them with the actual technical skills that they need to, to do that job. And that way they could tap into an internal talent pool that's already loyal to the company and are likely to stay, especially if you actually give them that break, that opportunity to move on. So I think that's something that insurance businesses should look into as well, upskilling their own people, and then maybe seeding them with a few of these external experts coming in with great ideas from outside. The way, but the, the, one of the things to empower that also is to incentivize them by uh, giving them control and accountability. The more you give them projects or space to think for themselves, and perhaps not necessarily always have a, a product outcome, or but a place where they can be themselves and they can try and test new skills, apply new skills and give the space to be creative. And eventually some of that skill will be applied into the business sense as well. And the more you're open, you kind of, there, that, that interplay certainly helps in growing, you know, that entrepreneurial mindset if you like. Um, and people do expose themselves to newer things. And the more that happens, you start seeing that change in, in people upskilling themselves, being proactive rather than being more reactive to how things are, their perceived change. And also I think in terms of upscaling, I think that there, I, I kind of, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, but I kind of feel like there is a limit to it. Like for example, if you look at uh, a computer vision scientist, right, which is something insurers could use for uh, analyzing visual claims like a car accident or a property damage or something. If you look at the way they get trained, year one of university, they learn how to code in C++. Year two, they continue a couple of hands-on projects, and on top of that, they learn a lot of complicated geometry, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. And more recently, they learn a lot about statistics, neural networks, and it's not just knowing that neural network has got neurons that are concatenated. It's a lot of scientific mathematical details that they spend years and years understanding and, and staying critical about a lot of things they, they learned in the past and trying to innovate in their learning space. On top of that, uh, there are a lot of additional knowledges that they learn on top of all these core skills they have that helps them innovate in their kind of mixing things up kind of stage of work. So now, and that process usually, and, 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 a, and a brilliant computer vision scientist usually has a PhD, not to mention some of them might have uh, postdoc experiences. So these are extreme, tough, hands-on job for at least seven, eight, nine years. And, and then eventually they become a computer vision scientist that can go and sit down and solve a problem. Now, can we train an actuary who might know a little bit of SAS and a little bit of additional thing to become a computer vision scientist? I think it's not possible because it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental career change. I think, I think this is itself a, a key issue that a lot of the time um, we hear the news about AI uh, the news about AI that is dominating BBC, Sky, whatever, is the news about natural language processing, computer vision, reinforcement learning. These are, and particularly, uh, deep attached to all of them. Uh, so all these things are, are, are things that take seven, eight, nine years to build a career in. And, and, and these are seven, nine years of focused studies and hands-on experiences. So, so as a result, I think we should be realistic that if we want to upgrade an existing talent pool in the company, it's always a great decision. I think. And, and I think if, if we are not doing that already, forget about AI even, for any discipline, it, it's a risk to the company. So talent upgrade programs, talent training programs is, is a great idea and all companies have some version of it and further improvements is always a great idea there. But doing it with the hope that um, training the next generation of computer vision scientists or natural language processing scientists out of uh, uh, basic actuarial training, I think it's a little bit of a um, I don't think it's the most efficient way of doing it. But training an actuary to kind of upgrade the skills, maybe to learn a little bit about Bayesian statistics or start to code in Python or R or something. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a wonderful thing to do. And I think uh, most insurers already started some parts of it. Well, then using partnerships, um, would that be an option on top of also being realistic, like the insurance industry being realistic about the amount of money that they would pay for that talent because where it seems that um, the insurance industry is a bit in a quandary is like, as you rightly said, like being able to skill up a workforce to the level with the speed and change that it's happening is very tough and will that happen with an actuary, we, we don't know. But then at the same time, if we are looking to import these experts, AI experts, is the insurance industry 
in a place at the moment that can it can compete even just on a salary level, not even without the admission statement that you could sell mm. with a startup or whatever. Can the insurance industry right now compete on the salary basis with those people? And I know that there was a bit of debate before this panel in regards to the person that you need to try and find that isn't just based around money. I mean, yeah. is yeah. that... Well, so we were having a debate before because uh, because Razor had some experiences recently. I don't know if he wants to talk about it, but um, I, I think actually we all had that experience where our the, our best people <laughs> our best people get poached by big technology organizations who can pay incredible salaries that uh, that that um, we uh, we are not able to pay as either startups or as uh, or traditional organizations, and so we have a challenge there. Um, and I, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure that, that we can um, keep up with them. Um, what I was going to say is, if we can find people who are mission-driven, like Richard said, an option, of, of course, for more established companies is to break out a, a part of the business and run it in a sort of start-up start fashion. Um, a great example I've seen of that in another industry is British Gas, who, of course, as you all know, is a very big and very traditional, very traditional hierarchical organization. When they wanted to start their Hive group, who does all the smart apps and the IoT stuff, they really started it as a new business. It was owned by British Gas, but it was in a different location, different team, complete free hands to work. And it really had that startup y feeling, it had the mission feeling to it. So that's of course one option as well, is to either well either buy a startup or, or start it, start your own sort of internal startup. Yeah, I think it's really hard it's really hard to imagine a situation where you, you do this successfully, but you don't hire people who are mission-driven. Uh, I don't think there's like, many examples of that in the world. Um, so the question is, like, how do you get someone with a lot of self-hatred to join your, your thing and invest five <laughs> years of their time doing it on an idea that may not work? Um, I think the way you do that is you, you either partner with a startup who, who has that vision and people truly believe it and have ownership, or a kind of a big company imitates it or mimics that with some sort of, you know, they come up with a new brand, like Hive is a good example. Yeah. I, I think that's almost like an exhaustive way to think. I, I don't know if there's another model that is proven to work. I think Booking.com is a, a good example of, of, of a, maybe a third type where, where, where a big company buys, buys something and that kind of saves the company. But, yeah. The one thing I'd say that doesn't work, certainly, is companies going off, looking at the trend, jumping on the bandwagon, hiring a lot of data scientists or highly skilled people and then not really having anything to give them a, mm. an environment for them to be creative and, and actually you know, driving change. That is where you get a lot of disillusionment and therefore churn from the business. And, and then people just have that perception that uh, yeah, this is not the right company to go and work for. So you and need to create that environment at the very start and then try and attract talent according to what you're trying to work. So giving them the sense of purpose, the mission, is certainly a good way to start because they become the spokesperson inside and outside the organization to talk about the work that they're doing. And also I think there's a, there's, there's, it's quite important to speak of internally and externally how uh, you are making a difference. Uh, whether you, know, you have the companies like the old technology companies, Google uh, and so on, having researchers or people working in the company publishing work in academic conferences. The number of companies now publishing or technology companies publishing in academic conferences is far greater than just universities. Um, and that shift speaks of the growing mass of talent but also industry focus on delivering something that's more um, tangible. I think on, in, on, on one part of the question that you were asking around um, partnerships, I think I think that there are a few parameters in that space. Like, I think I think every company has got a lot of. I mean, every company probably any big company has got some partnership with Microsoft or Excel or whatever. So, so I think there are partnerships. It's just a matter of where do you want to partner. Like, if like for example, building the next generation of a spreadsheet, probably that's not what an insurance company wants to do. So it might be better to partner because it's probably. A, a commodity of some sort already and also it's not a strategic to the mission but building the next generation of trading strategy if you're an insurance company with a trillion dollar asset under management I think it makes sense for it to be a strategic initiative that that you you really need to eventually figure it out so you might as well invest in-house 
partly it could be jointly with some sort of partnership, but partnership should not, in strategic initiatives that are not commoditized, partnership should not be an excuse to not hire. I think it's very important because I think um, otherwise, over time, uh, you're going to lose even that part to, to another uh, series of partners and eventually you end up becoming more and more pushed to the back of the value chain. Uh, well, just one more thing on the on the financials. I've um, got 30 seconds. 30 seconds, no problem. <laughs> I'll be really brief because we had one crazy idea just before we left the, the, the briefing room before, which was profit share. <laughs> yep. Because if you've got a fantastic data scientist who, who makes your organization make millions in, in, in profits, why not share a, a fraction of it with them? And that way you can incentivize them further. I 100% agree. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you very much um, to our wonderful panel here. I would say that we can talk on this for like hours, but we've got an extra 20, 30 minutes in Meet the Speaker session downstairs. So if you do have any questions that you have for the panel, I'd implore you to go there, where they're all very happy to answer those one-on-one. -on -one. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.